Is it on? Is it on? Is this thing recording? Hello, hello. Welcome everybody to part two of This Is What Healing Looks Like. I got my shades on. Y'all see I got a little light out there to, you know, cast some shadows and things. Woo! Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm on time. I'm on time. Can y'all hear me out there? Let me know. Can you hear me? I am so nervous. I don't get nervous about a lot of things, but reading my autobiography and really getting into this is, is, oh my God. Hey, Cheyenne, how are you, girl? I got to get with you. I want to know how you like the new place. So this is how we're going to do this. So I got to calm myself down, get into my, my zen. So as people are coming in the room, because I don't think most people expected me to be on time today. Um, before I start reading, what I will do is, you know, answer any questions that you all may have about the book or about the process or any questions that you have at all. Uh, excuse me, sir. I'm in here recording. Thank you. Uh, but anyway, so yes, um, ask, ask something. I don't know. Thank you, True Review Tracy. Um, Cooking with Love. I've been so busy, so I'm trying to figure out the perfect time to bring it back because I don't want to bring it back and have to stop. Um, so uh, I'm thinking maybe in about two weeks we'll, we'll get into it because I'm almost done with my summer school courses um, as far as my master's program. All right, so do y'all have any questions? Somebody ask me something. I don't know. Ask, ask something, please. Uh, let's see. Let me do this right now. Okay. Ooh, I'm gonna put my foot up here so I can get comfortable. I got to get comfortable for this. We got six people in the room. Who's in here besides Shine and True Review Tracy? I gotta look at the picture. Let's see closer. Oh, is it Tracy? Tracy? Where? <laughs> oh, Cheyenne, I'm gonna get you. Where do I see myself in five years? Mm. Mm. I honestly don't know. There are several projects um, that, you know, we've got the documentary going. Um, it's now in the editing process, so I'm very excited about that. Um, I, I see my personal business as far as motivational speaking growing. I had a meeting today about consulting work. Um, so I'm very excited about that. So, um, yeah, I just see myself, you know, in a, in a higher position when it comes to law enforcement. Um, still doing that, crafting my, my speaking and, and consulting business and just still inspiring the community because that's what all this is about. You know, with COVID going on. Hi, Mary from New York. With COVID, stress, people being stuck in the house, um, you know, and all of these just traumas and, and negative experiences, my drive is to inspire people that they can be successful and you can fight through it and you can talk about it and everything's going to be all right. Okay. So, all right, well, let's get into it. Um, we're going to get into chapter one of the book. I'm going to stay on here for about an hour. I got a little timer over here. So at the end of the hour, um, we'll stop. And then next Sunday at 7, we'll get back into it. We're only going to do chapter one of the book. Um, I probably should have chose a different chapter because chapter one of this book is my... Um... Hey, love! Baby! You are very loud. Pause one second. Let me text him real quick. Tell him to calm down in there. <clears throat> mm -mm 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 -mm. He on a conference call, but he's a loud talker. I love him, but he talking. He talking and laughing like a hyena. Here we go. Okay. Let's get into it. So anyway, so chapter one of this book is probably the hardest part I mean, 
I really get into just my my overall upbringing and all of the trauma. And so I was thinking about it today and I was like, why did I decide to read chapter one? Out of all of this that I have going on, why chapter one? Oh, well, thank you, Tracy. Tracy said, see, I can hear him. He said, I'm loud over here. It's, it's like piercing right here. I'm like, shh. But so chapter one is really difficult, but we're going to get into it. Um, I'm trying to delay the inevitable, um, but we're going to get into it. So let's let's just start. Right. Let's just let's just jump in. OK. <clears throat> so. Each part of the book, as it changes, has a title and the title of this is In the Beginning. My mother, Lenore Waters, was 22 years old and pregnant when she returned home to Pocomo City, Maryland. I was her firstborn and the firstborn in the extended family, weighing five pounds, 1.5 ounces, and measuring 19 inches. I was a cute little bundle of joy. I look back at pictures during this time and I have no memories of my earliest moments in life. However, it appeared that I was surrounded by family and love. I was two years old when my mother had my middle brother, Trey Kwan, whose father she married and nine years old when she had my youngest brother, Jaden. My mother was the oldest of four siblings, having one sister and two brothers. My grandfather was a pastor and my grandmother played piano in the church. As I grew up, I would hear my mother talk about being the black sheep of the family and how she felt like she was being judged. I noticed that my mother would change the way she spoke and acted when we were around the extended family, and this would annoy me. So if anybody knows me, they know that I get very um, upset when I'm around people that act one way around a certain group of people and then act another way. That's why I'm crazy all the time, and it kind of stems from my childhood. I also try to, as I'm, as I'm, as I'm writing and coming or, or, or picturing how I'm going to put this book together, what I'm trying to portray here in the beginning is that my family is basically, basically like every other family out there. I think sometimes when we see people, we have this image in our heads that they're perfect or that they don't have to go through anything. Um, and so my family dynamics and, um, you know, where I come from, it's, it's just like any other family, basically. Throughout my childhood, when things got rough, my grandparents' home was always open to us. To me, it seemed like a uh, seemed a little hypocritical, hypocritical that my mother felt the way she did, but I dared not question her. My grandparents, who lived in Unionville, Maryland, had a two-story house that seemed like a mansion. There were four bedrooms upstairs and a bathroom. Downstairs, there was a kitchen, a sitting room with a piano, a dining room, and a den. Later, as an adult, I would sometimes close my eyes and think about this place, my utopia. I can still see and feel the smiles, warmth, laughter, love, and safety that emanated from their home. My mother didn't like living with her parents, which isn't abnormal, but the truth is she had difficulty hiding her drug and alcohol abuse in my grandparents' home. She had to cut back and she could only go for so long before it was time to move on. In some sense, it felt like my mother was always looking for a way back to freedom. Some of the fondest moments of my childhood took place in Unionville and Pocomoke City. Those days included long hours spent playing childhood games such as red light, green light, hopscotch, Simon Says, and hide and seek with my cousins and neighbors. Listen, I don't even know if the new kids nowadays know what that's all about. While at my grandparents' home, there was no fear and no worries about having the bare essentials, food and a roof over our heads. My family was like every other family. I grew up listening to my mother, grandparents, aunt and uncle sing, and at a young age, I tried to imitate them. One Saturday, I got up in church and began to sing a solo. The congregation in response to my singing either covered their faces because I was singing off key or tried to sing with me louder than me so they could cover up my voice. I felt a little embarrassed, but I vowed to keep working on it. I idolized my grandfather and I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to sing and dress like him. 
And most of all, I wanted to follow in his footsteps and become a preacher. Listen, that was my first time. I, listen, just reading it and thinking back to that moment. Um, that was like my first ever performance. And it's like one of those things where you practice at home and, oh, you think I'm just going to be the shit. I'm going to get up in front of the church and sing and I'm going to blow the walls off the church. Forgive my cousin. But anyway, and I got up there and I was so off key, could not. But listen, I will tell you, and I don't know if it's in the book. I can't remember now. It's been too long. But I never forgot that moment, how it felt to sing in front of people, not being able to sing. But I came back and I gave it to him. So anyway, I also wanted to learn how to play the piano like my grandmother. I would often ask her to teach me, but she would say, I'm not good enough to teach anyone. I never believed her. My grandmother could make a piano sing and she had a presence that was calm and reassuring. She was the glue that held the family together and the voice of reason in moments of chaos. She also didn't take any foolishness and could put anyone in their place with just a look. All good things eventually come to an end. Our mom, Trey Kwan, and I would leave my grandparents' house and strike out on our own. As I got older, I dreaded leaving the comfort of my grandparents' home. Life became a constant roller coaster with ups and downs, but mostly downs. Our mother married Trey Kwan's father. I don't remember the wedding or if there even was one, but I remember the days that followed and the horror that enveloped our home as my brother's father beat our mother. There were times that I saw her being dragged around, her fingernails gripping the floorboards and carpet as she, failed, as she flailed and attempted to guard herself from the vicious slaps, punches, and kicks. She was small in stature, and her husband towered over her. In spite of this, she always fought back. One evening, while standing in the living room of the apartment we stayed in, I watched as our mom was thrown through a window. Her body met the ground with a loud thud, but she sprang back up and kept fighting. I vividly remember sitting next to her on the couch and picking the glass out of her arms. As I tried to blink, black, blink back tears at the sight of blood all over her face. As I cried and looked at, as, she, as I cried, she looked at me and said, baby, mama is all right. Even though she wouldn't admit it, I knew she was in pain. I felt so helpless during these fights as the oldest, I felt the need to defend my mother, but there wasn't much I could do. Sometimes my mother had to get the last word in during an argument which would set her husband off. I often wish she just let it go, but that was not in her nature. No matter how bad the beating was, she made sure she got the last word and she made sure she understood that she wasn't afraid of him. In my eyes, my mother was a superhero. She was unstoppable. There were times when she was being beaten and I would get beaten trying to jump in and protect her. When I became involved, she fought even harder, like a mother bear defending her cub, even if she couldn't win. In the aftermath, my brother and I would tiptoe around the shards of shattered glass spread across the floor while maneuvering around toppled furniture and broken dishes. Even though I envied Trey Kwan for having his father around, the jealousy was obscured by the domestic abuse. This trauma forged a special bond between him and me. Oftentimes, I would grab Trey Kwan when the fighting started, and we would escape into a different room where I would hold him tightly and tell him everything was going to be all right. Sometimes we cry as we listen to the yelling and the harsh sounds of various items in the household breaking. Sometimes I would leave him and go check on our mom to make sure she was okay. So with all of these things going on, when I think about domestic abuse and how that's really impacted my life now, being a law enforcement officer, going into these situations. In the beginning, I had a hard time taking those experiences, those memories out of my head and going in with a clean slate. Meaning when I first start, started to deal with domestic abuse victims, I would always walk in with the mindset that the male party was at fault and that that was going to be the person going to jail. And so 
I had to recognize that and I had to work on that um, really, really hard in the beginning of my law enforcement career so that I was making fair and unbiased um, decisions. I remember one time I left Trey Kwan in the bathroom when we stayed on Bonneville Avenue in Pocomoke City, Maryland. I found his father choking our mother on the floor near the kitchen. I will never forget the sight of my mother and the expression on her face as she called at him and fought for air. Without a moment's hesitation, I grabbed a paddle that was lying on the floor that we used to, that was used to beat me and my brother. I ran towards him, closed my eyes and swung as hard as I could. The paddle hit his head hard. As I turned to run, he reached out and grabbed my leg. I fell, immediately began to kick to break his grasp. One hand held me and the other hand cradled his head. My mother who was coughing and fighting to catch her breath slid out from under him. As he started to hit me, my mother grabbed a frying pan and started swinging. He let me go and I ran back to the bathroom. I don't know how the fight ended, but eventually our mom came to the bathroom and got us and he was gone. Sometimes during these fights, I wanted to call the police, but I knew it would never, it would not go over well. My mother wanted to handle her own issues her way without, without outside interference. Lord, I can't talk. She would say things like, call the police and I'll fuck them up too. She was a little firecracker and not to be played with. Eventually, our mother separated from my brother's father, but the memories of when and why escapes me. I just know I felt a sense of relief when he stopped coming around. So I, I start the book with that experience um, because so many people deal with it. And I think when we talk about domestic abuse, um, there's different levels to it, but all have very serious impacts on people's lives. And so some people will say, if you're in a relationship and someone's not putting their hands on you, um, then, oh, it's okay if it's just, um, you know, uh, an emotional thing. Um, but sometimes the emotional impact of domestic abuse without the physical part is just as bad. So I say all of that to say this, people will stay in relationships because they do it for the kids. Um, and ultimately, I think you are hurting your kids worse to have to go through that and to see that and to hear that. So sometimes you have to take that step um, you know, of bravery with courage, if you will, and get out of it um, because um, you're doing more harm. It's a, it's a false um, stance, a false line of hope uh, to stay in a relationship like that. And everyone that, or I shouldn't say everyone, but most people that I deal with when it comes to domestic abuse and being an advocate and, and, and sitting down with people, they always think that, they always, most people think that um, nothing's going to happen to me. It's going to be that other person, that person we saw on the news, you know, the person that got killed, uh, the person that's beating on me will never take it that far. Um, and nothing could be further from the truth. You know, there were times where, like with my mom getting thrown out the window. I will never forget that. It was almost like a superhero moment. Here she gets thrown out of this window, glass breaking. You know, she's outside. She's then hit the ground. She pops back up. She's through the window. They're fighting again. And it was by the grace of God that she didn't get killed in that situation. Um, and so just make sure that if you need help, get the help. Um, my whole journey in my life is about breaking that cycle, that conflict cycle, that cycle of poverty. Um, and it's not easy to do, but you are much better off getting help and moving out of the situation than you can ever be in the situation. And if a person is beating on you, then they don't love you. That you know, we we say things like, you know, or I hear people say things like they do it because they love me and they just can't control themselves. 
that again is a false line, a false sense of reality. Um, and, and so what I will say to people before I move on is that if you are a friend of someone that's going through that, don't give up on them. Um, it is a mental thing that they have to break. It's a mental block. Um, oftentimes people who are in abusive situations go back time and time again as friends, as family. Um, you get tired of it. You get frustrated. You want to you know, turn them out, tune them out, let them go. Um, but you have to be there for them. You have to love them through it because eventually they will break the cycle. They just have to be ready to do it. Um, and that comes with counseling and support and a lot of different things. So, all right, moving on. I have said enough. A small detour. Of course, not all memories of my childhood were bad. One of the card games my mother and her friends and family would play was spades. I used to love to see her get excited and slam the card down on the table. During one of these games, one of my mother's cousins gave me a $2 bill and told me to split it with Trey Kwan. I ripped the bill in half and gave it to my brother as I had been told to do. The room erupted in laughter and neither of us understood what was so funny to the adults. If I lose you, I just heard thunder in the background. Um, so that is one, cause you know, with all the trauma and stuff that I experienced as a child, I struggle sometimes to find the good and I'm a positive person, an optimistic person. So I, I struggle to find those good moments, but that's one that I remember when I went back home for the first time, I tried to find that picture cause it was framed. It was a $2 bill. We had split it in half and um, I, I tried to find it, but unfortunately I couldn't. Um, but moving on, silence. In those days, home to me was wherever I laid my head on, my, on any given night. Regardless of where we lived, however, my mother would say, what happens in this house stays in this house. My mother made sure that Trey Kwan and I knew we were not to talk to, to our grandparents or anyone else about whatever issues we were, were having or had experienced. Oftentimes, my brother and I were left with the impression that if Child Protective Services were contacted, they would come and take us away. To avoid this, we learned, we learned at a young age to lie, act, and be deceitful. Some will call it street smarts, but I see these things as ingredients in the recipe for failure. Trey Kwan and I were on a path to becoming just another statistic well before we could make our own choices in life. And one of the things that I want to go back when I talk about statistics right now, we have Black Lives Matter, uh, Back the Blue, um, you know, just all of these different groups. One of the things, I don't know if you caught it, that I was talking about during the domestic abuse thing was that we were not allowed to call the cops. We were taught at a very young age, you know, you, you handle things on your own. Um, and so that was something that was ingrained into me at, at a very young age. And we'll discuss it a little bit later in the book, but that was something also that I had to overcome going into law enforcement because I went into law enforcement being afraid of law enforcement, basically. Um, and that's based off of the experiences. My brother and I lived in government assisted living surrounded by people that were considered family. Labels were given like cousin, aunt and uncle but often these people were just friends and not blood relatives. <clears throat> One afternoon, my mother left our apartment to go to my aunt's, no blood relation, house. It was a beautiful day. The sky was blue with little to no clouds and a light breeze. Trey Kwan and I, along with the kids in the neighborhood were playing and running in and out of the house. I can still hear my mother's voice as she said, come through that door again and I'm going to break your back. We ran out of the house laughing, but knowing my mother wasn't playing, she would really try to break our back. And so it's interesting because some of these things, you know, as I travel, I get to travel and meet different people and it doesn't matter where you go. Um, you have some parents that will say stuff like that. And um, yeah. As I sat on the electric box that was in front of our apartment building with our other kids from the neighborhood, 
Our mom walked out of the building and said, I'll be back, behave yourselves, and off she walked. After a while, a new game of tag started up and we all ran in and out of the apartment building, around the cars and in the junkyard behind the building. Since mom was gone, the house was fair game as well. When you stepped into our apartment, you were in the living room. Immediately to the right was the dining area, which was across from the kitchen. Further down the hall was the bathroom, and past the bathroom were two bedrooms, one on each side of the hall. My mother was so proud to be in this apartment and would often say, this shit may not be much, but it's mine. At one point, I was tagged in, and I began chasing my cousin, no blood relation, Theodore, because he was the closest to me. As we ran from behind the buildings through the alley, I came within arm's reach of tagging him. But every time I got close enough, he would speed up just a little faster. We continued down the alley, around the car, and back into the apartment. I thought to myself, he's trapped. I got him. I ran into the living room behind him, and finally I tagged him. He then immediately tagged me back and shouted it and ran to the bedroom. I shared with my brother. When I got to the bedroom, Theodore was just standing there. He said, I don't want to play that game anymore. So I looked at him and wondered what game we would play. As he stood there, he motioned for me to come over to him. As I did so, he pushed me down on the floor. When I rolled over to get up and ask him why he pushed me, he pulled his penis out and asked me to put it in my mouth. When I refused, he grabbed my head and forced me to do it over and over again. Finally, he let go of my head and ran out of the bedroom. I had a nasty, salty taste in my mouth. So I started spitting as I ran to the bathroom with my tongue out and began rinsing my mouth out in the sink. I didn't understand what had just happened, but something inside me told me it was wrong. After I came out of the bathroom, Theodore wanted to continue to play tag. However, I didn't want to play anymore. So he ran outside. Before he left, he told me not to tell, and I had to pinky promise that I wouldn't. He was 14 years of age and I was six years old. As I sat on the couch, I watched the door and couldn't wait for my mother to return. When the apartment door opened and my mother walked in, I felt a sense of relief. I immediately wanted to tell her what had happened. I wondered if I should tell her and for a split second, I paused, then I let it all out. My mother was known for having a quick temper and known for being outspoken. She never held back her emotions. As I told her what happened, I watched her body language for cues. She was emotionless and quiet. I had never witnessed, witnessed this before. I was confused. Like smoke, my mother vanished into thin air without saying a word. She had left me alone standing in front of the door. My mother returned a short while later with Lisa, Theodore's mom, and asked me to tell her what had happened. I was afraid because I felt like I had done something wrong. I didn't understand what was going on. I wasn't supposed to tell and I had broken the pinky swear. I also could tell my, by both of their body language that they were worked up, tense and angry. As I told Lisa what had happened, she began pacing back and forth. She apologized to me and my mother and took off out the door. I could hear her through the front window as she yelled, Theodore, Theodore, bring your motherfucking ass, Theodore. When he came to her, she grabbed him by the back of his neck, brought him into the apartment and made him sit down in front of me. My mother was pacing the floor at this point. Lisa had a cigarette hanging out of her mouth. I kept looking at the ash as over half of the cigarette had burned up, but the ash was still there. She said to her son out of one side of her mouth, what did you do to this boy? Theodore looked at his mom and before he could say anything, she hit him in the chest, which knocked the wind out of him. She started beating him. As I sat there watching this, I shrank back on the couch. All I knew was that because I told on him, he was being beaten. My aunt encouraged my mother to join in and they punched, kicked and slapped him. Lisa then dragged Theodore out of the house and into the front yard where they both continued to beat him. I just sat on the couch and cried. 
I got up from the couch briefly, looked out, the, looked out of the window, and saw what was happening. Then I went back to the couch, curled up into a ball, and cried. I was upset and crying because I had been beaten like that before. I felt like everything was my fault. I also realized that what he had done to me was bad to be punished for it in this way. After all was done, no one spoke of it again. My mom came back in and grabbed her alcohol. Theodore and Lisa left and that was it. There was no conversation to explain what had just occurred. I took a bath and went to bed. The next day I woke up and life went on. Wow, that's a lot. And one of the things when it comes to dealing with being molested and molestation is there's very few times that children are going to say something, especially if it's considered a family member or someone that's close. And so what I will say before we move on is that if you are told they dealt with it the street way, but what is important is that you go back and explain to that child what happened, the significance of it, and that you deal with it. Um, because I, all I knew was what had happened at that point was bad, um, but I didn't really understand the significance until some time later. Um, yeah. Months later, <clears throat> mom took Trey Kwan and I to Lisa's house for a barbecue. As I entered the house, I wondered how Theodore was going to respond to seeing me. I was shocked because it seemed like he had forgotten about what had happened. It seemed like everyone had forgotten except, except me. And I say that because almost every day from the time that first molestation had occurred, I thought about it. And one of the things that I could not get out of my mind is his mom dragging him out by his legs out the door and the way they beat him. That was what really stuck in my head. And I felt like I did something wrong. I shouldn't have said anything. I, I broke his trust. I broke the promise. And so, you know, couple of months go by, every day I'm thinking about this and, and, and replaying the incident in my, in my head, not talking about it. But then we we're now in this place and I'm like, well, did everybody forget about what happened? What's going on here? And so we're at the barbecue. The party started with the barbecue outside, but as night approached, everything was moved indoors. Being a true mama's boy, I led some of the kids into the kitchen where the adults were. As I walked through the door, I saw Lisa snorting what I thought was baby powder through her nose while holding one nostril. My mom then yelled at us to get out of the kitchen and go play. I didn't want to play. I wanted to be with my mom. I made sure throughout our time there that I kept a close eye on my brother and I made sure we stayed with the group of kids. Something at the subconscious level was telling me to be careful even though things appeared to be normal. I didn't want to play in the house, but it was either go play or get beaten for not doing as I was told. As I turned to walk out of the kitchen, I paused for a split second and I thought to myself, why is Lisa sniffing baby powder? Gross. When the door closed behind me, all the kids ran through the house and up the stairs. I reluctantly followed. But minutes later, my concerns were alleviated as we all played in the big group in one of the rooms. We were turning off the lights and pretending to be ghosts. Then we switched the game to hide and seek. My focus became finding the best spots to hide and no one found me the first couple of rounds. As everyone scattered, I chose to hide under the bed in Lisa's room. I smiled ear to ear because I had the best hiding spot. Surely I was not going to be found. I heard the footsteps coming up the stairs and I heard Theodore say, 
ready or not, here I come. And then I heard his steps coming down the hallway. It's almost as if he had a tracking device on me as he drew near. The door creaked open and he dropped to the floor and said, found you. As I crawled out from under the bed, I tried to walk out of the room. Theodore then stepped in front of the door and closed it behind him. I immediately felt paralyzed by fear and I couldn't move. I couldn't speak and I couldn't scream. My mind was telling me to do something, but my body wouldn't respond. I knew I was at his mercy, but I wondered what exactly he was going to do to me this time. I could see the anger in his face. My instincts told me to get out. He got close to me, then punched me in the chest, knocking the air out of me, and then began choking me. As I tried to put up a fight, he took me down to the floor and pinned me there. I tried to scream, but nothing was coming out. I pushed, pulled, and kicked, but it was, wasn't enough to make him stop. It wasn't enough to make him stop. He undid my pants and just laid on top of me. It was almost as if the more I fought back, the more excited he got. I started praying to God for someone to walk in and save, and save me. I was on my stomach and out of nowhere, I felt an intense pain. I felt like I was going to pass out. I lay there for what felt like hours and became numb. As I lay there, it was almost as though I had left my body and I was looking down and watching what was happening to me. Finally, he stopped, got up and walked out of the room. Exhausted, I lay in the spot where he left me. <clears throat> Suddenly, I had the urge to have a bowel movement. I wanted to get to my mom, but I knew I wasn't going to make it. So I went into the bathroom, locked the door, and I sat on the toilet in pain. As I sat on the toilet, I tried to go, but nothing happened. I stood up and looked, and there was much there wasn't much in the toilet. I reached for the toilet paper and wiped, and I noticed blood running down the back and inside of my thighs. At the sight of blood, I started to lose control of my emotions and began to cry inconsolably. Theodore broke into the bathroom, defeating the lock as if it was nothing. As he walked in, he grabbed me by the throat again. He told me that if I told anyone, he would kill me. Something in the way he looked at me and the way he said it led me to believe he really meant it. At six years old, the moment came to define this moment or that moment came to define me in ways I would have never imagined. When he left, I cleaned up. I realized there was no one to protect me and that I had to learn to protect myself. I was robbed of my childhood in that moment. I knew my mother loved me. That was never a question. I just don't think she had the skills to deal with everything that was going on when I was a child. I had told her about the first time I was sexually abused, but I knew that due to the drug and alcohol abuse, she wasn't always going to be there to protect me. I made a choice to try to, to survive by not saying anything. I became hypersensitive of my actions because I was afraid someone would find out. I learned to control my emotions and I learned to become a chameleon in order to blend in. I knew that if I had said anything, eventually Theodore would be able to get to me. Oftentimes I wondered what my, mo my mother would have done had she known. I wandered around the house and fell asleep on the floor in a corner in one of, my, in one of the bedrooms on the second floor. When I woke up the next morning, I kept thinking about what had happened. I thought about it repeatedly as I lay there. The other kids in the house were up and running around about the same time that I woke up. Most of them were upset because they had been in their hiding places for so long the night before that they had fallen asleep. When I saw Theodore for the first time, he acted as if nothing had happened. At this moment, I realized he had concealed his feelings and emotions and had taken Action, acting lessons as well. It was almost like I had had a bad dream, but the soreness I felt reminded me it wasn't so. As time went on, I tried to stay closer to my mother to prevent it from happening again. 
When the adults would hang out, they always shooed the kids away and told us to go play. My mother didn't know that I would try to stay close to her to protect myself. When we lost our apartment and ended up moving in with Theodore and his family, the sexual abuse happened more and more. As I grew older, I would fight or do everything I could to avoid him because I was determined that I wasn't going to keep being hurt. After a while, Theodore got tired of fighting. So he told me, if you don't do it, your brother will. I knew then at approximately eight years old that I had to protect Traquan at all costs. There was nothing I wouldn't do to ensure that he was okay. There wasn't even a pause or a deliberation as I decided what needed to be done. There were times when Traquan would be a few feet away from me while the molestation was occurring, and I assumed that he was asleep. Over time, escaping my body in those moments and being somewhere else, on a beach, singing on a stage, or on my private airplane made all the difference. I lived out fantasies in my head, longing for someone to protect me, for someone to take me away from what was going on. I prayed, but it seemed like God couldn't hear me. Hindsight being 2020, God answered my prayers, just not the way I expected him to. Lisa and my mother were close friends, but they would get into arguments and my mom would say to Traquan and me, pack your shit up, we're getting out of this raggedy motherfucker. These breaks and staying with Lisa gave me time to heal both physically and mentally. I was glad to leave each time, even though most of the time we didn't have anywhere to go. The first couple of times we returned, I felt sick knowing what was going to happen, but eventually even those emotions would fade. There, were no, there was no question of why me, <clears throat> I'm gonna go back. There was no question of why me, it was just life as I knew it. Hmm. Wow. Um, so when people ask why um, the response, this is something that I still struggle with, molestation um, of kids, rape, those types of things are still things that those are areas that I'm working on. So, um, you know, most of the time I have control of my emotions, but going into a, a situation where a child has been molested and I have to deal with the parent that's molested the child, because it doesn't only happen with males, it happens with females as well. Um, I have a very hard time treating them with respect, dignity, or any of that stuff. And, you know, we have due process and all that type of stuff. So those types of cases I try to stay away from. Um, notice in here I talk about, you know, telling my mom, you only may get one chance for your kid, your child, your cousin, your nephew to come and tell you something. And so um, what I find difficult is that some parents will, if they believe the child, will still have a relationship with the person who violated their child and still have that person around their kids because they think that they've been rehabilitated or that they've, they've grown beyond it. Listen, if you've ever done anything like that, you deserve to be put away for life. Um, and oftentimes you'll find that people who, who've been victims of molestation, they in turn go and do it to someone else because especially at a young age, they may not know that it's wrong. Um, but once you become an adult, um, there's no excuse for that, that type of stuff. Even, you know, at this point, you know, eight years old, I, I knew what was happening to me was wrong. Um, I don't know. There's just so much to unpack in that. Um, but I, what ends up happening in a theme that runs through the early parts of my childhood is that people knew that my brother was everything to me. And so I felt like the man of the household and I had to protect him. And you will see how that comes back to bite me in the end or in, in, the, in chapter two of the book, I believe it is. You'll see how all of those days, nights of being molested and him being there, me thinking that he's asleep, he's actually awake and he's wanting me to fight 
not knowing that I've been told if I continue to fight, it's going to be him. And you'll see how that, that plays out in chapter two of the book. Um, but that's a lot, a lot to unpack. <sighs> Made it through it. Let's move on. Um, a random act of kindness. I needed something when I, as I'm writing this and putting this all together, I needed something that was just something positive because it takes you to such a dark place. As we move from place to place, staying with friends and cousins in the area, we'd eventually wear out our welcome. The last time we stayed with Lisa, like every time before, we packed up what little bit we had and left. This time we left in the middle of the winter night during a snowstorm. My mother, brother, and I walked down 4th Street in Pocomoke City, Maryland, towards the train tracks. As we approached Mitchell's Market, a car pulled over and a woman got out and asked my mother if we needed anything. My mother said no. As we continued to walk, the woman walked back to her car, opened the back door, took the coats off her children and gave one to me and one to my brother. She gave me the Dallas Cowboys jacket and Trey Kwan got the Baltimore Ravens jacket. These were the first starter brand name jackets that we ever owned. This act of kindness is something I will never forget. It also made me a Cowboys fan for life. I felt so upset towards our mom for not allowing this lady to help us. My brother and I were exhausted and cold. I still hear my mother's voice as she told us, we're almost there. All too often, my mother's pride and stubbornness got in the way. Now listen, I know we got a lot of Redskins fans. I don't know what the name of the new team is, so forgive me for my unpolitical correctness. But I'm a Cowboys fan through and through. I've never been through Texas, but I love the Cowboys. I've always loved the Cowboys just because of that starter jacket. And I wore that jacket until the sleeves came right up to heel. That jacket was as dark as the tar of the road, and I kept it on. Um, but I, you know, I'll never forget that. Um, and that's part of my mission in life. You know, you never know when you you do something that's positive um, for someone. You, you never really know the impact. And I don't know if the lady will ever see this. Um, I don't know if the lady will ever read my book. I don't know if the lady is ever still alive. Um, but that's a moment that I'll never forget that, that kindness and generosity in that moment. And, um, you know, I just remember my mom being so stubborn, but going back, when we went back for the documentary, um, something that will also stay with me is all the people that live in Pocomoke city, Maryland, that remembered me, um, that have followed my journey, um, and this, some of these places, the street names are still the same. Um, it was just so, it was so impactful um, for them to corroborate some of the things that I've said. Um, but just, they were excited that I was coming back home and that I'd never forgotten them. And even though there were some dark times, there's always good in the darkness, right? Um, and so just, it's, it's a place that I can immediately, when I get back there, I feel at home. I feel at home. All right. So how long have you been on here? We've been on here for 48 minutes and 27, 20, 29 seconds. I'm going to read one more because this is enough. I need a, a, a I need something, the emotional release. So we're going to read one more section of this discipline. As we made it to her friend's house off of Clementine Street, we walked in and I saw sheets and blankets hung in front of all the entrances into the living room. There was a kerosene heater in the middle of the room and a pot on top of the heater with water in it. Now, you know, for some of y'all out there that's to struggle, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Trey Kwan and I were so relieved. We went in, sat as close as we could to the heater. We were given food and put to bed in the living room on a pullout sofa bed. Now, listen, we got so close to that, that that heater that I can still feel like I was burning my hands off and my arms and things. I ain't have no hair. I was too young at that point. But anyway, the next morning when we woke up, I didn't want to move because it was so cold. The kerosene heater had gone out during the night while we slept. The one thing I hated about the new home was there was no toilet. That meant no matter how cold it was, if I had to use the bathroom, 
I had to go outside to an outhouse. Y'all, listen. Some see y'all new things. Y'all don't know what that's all about. But it's cold. We don't walk through a winter storm. The kerosene heater is out. And now I got to get up and go pee outside. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. One morning, because I got tired of this. One morning I had to pee so badly, but I didn't want to get up. So I laid there and peed in the bed. Piss it. That's what you can call me. I laid there. I wasn't sleeping peed. I peed on purpose because I was like, listen, I'd rather lay here in this bed and pee than get up and go out there. I'm, I'm done with this cold stuff. Okay? That was a key. All right. Where was I at? The whipping that I got for doing it ensured from that point on I would brave the cold. My mom almost killed me in there. Okay? Our mother's favorite saying was, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. And in that moment, I believe she tried. And I, and I get the frustration with it because we have these people who are allowing us to stay in their home. And now I done peed in their bed. A little eight-year-old boy peeing in their bed. They want, She didn't want us to get kicked out. So she was probably frustrated with that, frustrated she ain't had no money, frustrated she don't... All these frustrations. So she tried to make sure that I knew that if I did that again, that she was going to break both my legs. So from then on, I just didn't drink no water and I didn't have to worry about it. Because you know how you do as a kid. You want you want water before you go to bed. Then you wake up, you got to pee. And I didn't go out at night. I wasn't going to, you weren't going to get me at night. So anyway, neither here nor there. Our mother was tough on me when it came to punishment. One time she was eating chicken tenders and fries and without asking, I reached to grab a fry. Within the blink of an eye, I felt a sharp pain between my pinky and ring finger on my right hand. My mother had stabbed me with her fork. I had a scar there for a long time. And in that moment, I learned rather quickly not to put my hands on people's plates. Yes, let's see, is that scar still in there? No. Mm -mm. Cocoa butter does a body good. But listen, and that's part, you know, these things that happen to you as children affect you and how you go through life. And so I am the type of person when we go somewhere, we hanging out and we eat, please don't eat off my plate. I don't like it. Um, I You order what you want. I order what I want. When I'm done with it, you can have it. But if you reach your hand on my plate, we're going to have a problem. And so my husband know that. My family know that. We don't play no games. Now, his family, I just sit there in the corner with my plate and I watch them. They all order different things. And then they eat off of each other's plate. And I'm like, you know, that's what they do. But not for me. For me and mine, no. I don't care. You order two entrees. You can't have none of mine. If I'm going to eat this, I order what I want. That's why we work, okay? So we have that debate, but that's why my mama took my... I'm surprised she didn't take my finger off. But anyway, it's raining again. All right, so where are we at? Rolling your eyes and sucking through your teeth could almost get you killed when I was growing up. On one occasion, I told my mother after she had beaten me that I was going to call the cops on her. She replied, if you want to call 911, go ahead. Let social services take you. So I picked up the phone. She struck me across my hand and I dropped the phone. My hand looked like this when she struck me. It took me a second to catch my breath so the cry could come out. She then said, go lay your ass down and stop crying before I give you a reason to cry. Another time I was standing on the edge of the bathtub and my mother told me a couple of times to get down. I sucked through my teeth and rolled my eyes and in the next second I thought I saw heaven. My mother yanked my leg and I fell hitting my head on the tub faucet. One of her friends came in and I can remember the shock on her face when she saw the blood everywhere. She told my mom to call for an ambulance. My mom said, he'll be all right. She refused to call an ambulance. She said, they're not going to lock my black ass up. She looked at me, looked away, and then looked back a second time and said, stop that damn crying before I give you something to cry about. Now I'm laying there about to die. 
I still got the scar in my head. There's a scar right here from where she, she, you know, took my feet out from under me and I'm hitting the faucet and stuff. I'm laying there about to die and I'm crying blood everywhere. And she tell me to stop crying before she give me something to cry about. Can you imagine that? Now, listen, it's funny now because I survived it. But in the moment, you know, and it's so I would get so mad because her and her friends would talk about this stuff and they'd be laughing. I'm like, she she almost killed me. And they thought it was so funny. It, it, crazy. I lay there and thought I was going to die. Eventually, my head was wrapped with a towel and I was sent to bed. Concussion and all that. I was just laid up, just keep, just craziness. This is the craziness that this is called street justice. This is how they do in the in the in the hood. One day in school, I decided to be fun, the funny kid. And I was always trying to be the funny kid because I wanted to take the, the attention off of my clothes, the way I smelled. You know, my ears used to be like this big. So I was always trying to, and I had one ear that was pushed out like this. So I was always trying to take the attention off of uh, those things. And so I would be a class clown. My mom was called about it. By the time I got home from school, I had forgotten about what I had done. I walked into the house and my mom said, go take a shower. You're in the house for the night, for the night since you don't know how to act. In my mind, I thought, okay, that's it. I don't mind staying in the house. I'm like, okay, whatever. I can do that. I don't want to be outside anyway. Easy. I got into the shower and started singing. I was so into my song that I didn't hear my mother come into the bathroom. She snatched the curtain back and I felt a stinging and a burning sensation. I realized that my mother was beating me with an extension cord. I hit notes higher than Patty in that moment. That's Patty LaBelle that I'm referencing. I was somewhere over the rainbow, honey. I fell out of the shower, wrapped up in the shower curtain. I ran through the house as she chased me. I slid under the dining room table, but like the Incredible Hulk, my mother flipped it over and kept swinging. I can look back now as an adult and find the humor in these moments, but it's only by the grace of God that I was never seriously injured. Whew, that is a lot, child. That is too much. Where are we ending up at? I'm, I'm done. An empty shell is where we're going to start next Sunday at 7. Look, I done threw the book. I done had enough of it. Lord Jesus, take me now. No, it's and it's so interesting because this happens in every family. I don't care your race or anything. The first child gets the um, gets the harsh punishment, gets the strict rules, and all of that. Right? That's the first child. By the time they get to the third child, they, you know, falling out, doing all this stuff, and they don't even get they don't get nothing for it. That's you know. That's one of the things that frustrated me. My, my baby brother could talk back to my mom and I would duck like, oh, she about to get him. And she wouldn't do anything when she was living. So, you know, that was always an interesting dynamic. And I know my family is not the only one. But all right, y'all, we, we right at that hour mark. Thank you, Tracy. I hope y'all all y'all all are enjoying this. Um, you know, it's just a different element of the book, getting to hear me read about it. I'm I'm trying to unpack it as I'm reading it, um, but it is it is a lot. It's a lot. Um, thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. So I appreciate you all for um, again watching this. Make sure you subscribe. Hit notifications next Sunday at seven p.m. We will be here again. I don't think I have anything next weekend. So next Sunday at seven p.m. and then in two weeks we're going to bring Cooking with Love back. I'm only reading chapter one just to whet the appetite, let you know a little bit about it. And um, again, I love you all. Thank you so much for spending this hour with me. And uh, we might just start doing other books and just different conversations and stuff. Why not? I'm enjoying this. Love you. Be safe. Be blessed. And I will see you soon. Bye.